It was a week ago today at 6.44 a.m., Friday, March 20th, that we entered into the season of spring. That news was announced here in chapel, greeted by smiling faces and some vocal responses. But not this morning, yes. Technically, it's called the vernal equinox or the spring equinox, which is in meteorological terms, the moment the sun's northward shifting most direct rays fall on the equator. But I noticed something unusual as I studied the weather page in the Chicago Tribune last week. For March 20th, sunrise was listed at 6.54 a.m. and sunset at 7.03 p.m. After pursuing this a bit, I learned that the difference between 6.44 a.m. for the spring equinox and 6.54 a.m. for sunrise is accounted for by the fact that the equinox is recorded at 11.44 Greenwich Mean Time. But I still was puzzled. Doesn't equinox refer to equality of daylight and darkness? Shouldn't the vernal equinox happen on a date where sunrise and sunset are exactly 12 hours apart? Well, I found a fascinating article in the National Geographic News that explains all of this. Briefly, two points. First, sunrise is defined as the moment that the top end of the sun appears over the horizon. And sunset is when the last piece of the sun disappears below the horizon. Well, the vernal equinox is measured when the center of the sun crosses the equator. And secondly, the atmosphere of the earth bends the sunlight when it's close to the horizon, so the sun appears higher than it actually is. But enough of that. <laughs> By the way, one of the reasons that I have such a keen interest in the vernal equinox is that I was born on March 21st, which, in the year that I was born, that was the date of the vernal equinox. Adding even more intrigue to this question <laughs> for me, but probably not for you. So why all of this attention to daylight and darkness? There's a metaphor here that connects the physical world with the spiritual world. Frequently, people from off campus will ask me, how's the year going? What's it like at the college these days? Recently, I have shared the sense of heaviness or seriousness among students. It is not necessarily defined by a single issue, but I sense a weight of burden or concern among many on campus that may indeed be related to the global economic crisis or the unusually large number of grief situations and health matters facing students and your families. It seems that more than ever I'm speaking with students about their personal challenges with emotional, physical, and spiritual health. I'm interacting with many who describe their worlds as being overcast, if not dark, carrying heavy burdens of depression, doubt, or disappointment. And frankly, it is not only Wheaton College students or students in general who evaluate their life situations in terms of dark stretches or gray clouds. The cover story of the March issue of Christianity Today is called The Depression Epidemic. And the article cites the claim of the World Health Organization that depression is the second most common cause of disability worldwide after cardiovascular disease, and it is expected to become number one in the next 10 years. What I want to share this morning is not a substitute for counseling or therapy, but some words from Scripture that supply perspective and hope to our sometimes dark worlds. There are spiritual resources for all of us as we move over the vernal equinox into a life experience that is characterized by an increasing awareness of light and hope. The text of scripture that we began looking at in my last chapel talk is 
Romans 8. And if you have a Bible, I invite you to join me in looking again at this passage, Romans chapter 8. My Bible just naturally flops open to Romans 8. That's where the ribbon is, and that's where we will be this morning. It's part of a letter written by the Apostle Paul to first century Christ followers living in Rome. He's writing from Corinth in about A.D. 57, at the end of his third missionary journey. The people who first read this letter were struggling with their faith in a culture that was not friendly to Christian faith. And Paul wants to encourage these believers, so he writes in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The apostle goes on to talk about the future in huge and exciting terms, terms of liberation from bondage, glorious freedom. I love this text. It's one of those biblical passages that presents our hope for the future as something worth hoping for. Too often, promises of life after death or an eternal heavenly home are are phrased with such stale and trite terminology that very honestly, those prospects are hardly inviting. In fact, in a biblically illiterate world, when you ask the question, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Increasingly, we can expect the response, I'm not really sure. But if you phrase that question in a truly biblically informed way, asking if people would like to live in a world where wars have come to an end, where the need for and use of guns and bombs have been eliminated, where cancer has been cured, and the pain and suffering of disease are gone, where greed and corruption and abuse and racism are nowhere to be found, where friendship and care and cooperation and community are everywhere to be found, where natural beauty is flourishing on an earth that is bubbling with life and human creativity. Now, that's something that I think most people might be interested in. And that's the prospect that the Apostle Paul entertains as he writes in Romans 8 about our hope for the future. That's why N.T. Wright entitles his book on rethinking heaven, the resurrection, and the mission of the church, Surprised by Hope. Sometimes these biblical things are surprising if we have become just too overwhelmed by the darkness. But let's go on. Let's go on to consider something else that is all too often surprising. And this we find in Romans 8. Verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Paul is picking up the argument. He began in verse 18. He says in verse 26, in the same way. In verses 18 to 25, the apostle details that spectacular future for the children of God. Paul says, we're living in a day of suffering. But there is redemption. There is liberation. There is freedom. And to experience that in the ultimate sense... We experience that now to a degree as followers of Christ, but to experience that in the ultimate sense, we will have to wait for the final future fulfillment of all the promises of God. But how do we wait? How do we live in the here and now? We wait. We live with hope. And in verses 26 and 27, we have another answer to that question. How do we wait? How do we live? In this world where there is suffering and weakness, where there is injustice and unfairness, how do we wait? How do we live? With the Holy Spirit. That's how we live. We're not alone. We're not alone in our struggles. The Holy Spirit is present with us. 
And you who know your Bible, you who are pretty knowledgeable theologically and what Wheaton College student isn't, you say, well, yes, but of course. Let's not move on too fast from this point. Let's sit here for a moment and ponder the reality of this statement. Verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Who is the Spirit? You chuckle. Of course, Chappie K., we're talking about the Holy Spirit. The apostle is referencing, don't you know, the third person of the Trinity. But let me ask you this. For you, is the third person of the Trinity a theological concept or a living reality? I think it is Jesus himself who helps us most in understanding the living reality of the Holy Spirit, that intimate relationship that we can have with God in the person of the Holy Spirit. If we go back to the words of Jesus in the Gospel according to John, in chapters 14, 15, and 16, we hear this word paraclete for the first time, and it's echoed three more times from the lips of Jesus. That's paraclete, not parakeet. A parakeet is a bird, a member of the parrot family, often kept as a pet. Now, don't be confused here. Notwithstanding that at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove, and therefore the Holy Spirit is often symbolized by the image of a dove, the Holy Spirit is not a dove. The Holy Spirit is not a bird. The Holy Spirit is not a pet. The Holy Spirit is not a parakeet. He is the paraclete. Now, what does paraclete mean? Many of you know that paraclete is from the Greek words para and kaleo, meaning to call alongside. And therefore, the paraclete is one who is called alongside. The NIV translates the word counselor. In other versions, the word is translated helper or advocate. Eugene Peterson's The Message translates paraclete as friend. I think that's a bit informal and maybe even irreverent in this context. But maybe the New Jerusalem Bible does it best when it simply goes with the transliteration, paraclete. Jesus was about to leave his disciples, and so he shared his heart with them. He worked at preparing them for life in his absence. And basically he said, don't be afraid after I've gone. You're going to have another paraclete, meaning, of course, by that, that Jesus himself was a paraclete to them, a counselor, a helper, an intimate friend. But there's another one, just like me, Jesus was saying. There's another one, another paraclete, who would come later at Pentecost. And this second paraclete, the Holy Spirit, would be God indwelling the lives of Christ followers from then on. Again, you can read about this in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus informs us and encourages us to understand the living reality of the Holy Spirit. That simple statement in Romans 8, 26 is utterly profound. It can be life-changing. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, in all of our weakness and suffering and feelings of loneliness we are not alone. In all of our waiting with hope, someone is with us. Someone is there. That someone is the Holy Spirit. Now, tell me, is that a surprise? Jesus lived with his disciples for three-plus years as a counselor, a friend, an encourager, a helper, the Holy Spirit is that kind of help to believers today. And to take it even a bit further, just as Jesus was filled with and enabled by and led by the Holy Spirit, so are we. Right here in Romans chapter 8, back a few verses in verse 14, it says, the sons of God, the children of God, are described as those who are led by the Spirit of God. 
Remember the description of Jesus and his temptation in the wilderness? Remember that desert experience of our Lord's pain and suffering and confrontation by the evil one? Who was with Jesus? The text says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert, Matthew 4, 1. It is that 40 days in the wilderness that we are recalling in these days of the Lenten season. How good it is for us to remember our Lord's life of struggle and our Lord's resource in the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit, being alert and responsive and sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now that's something to ponder. But let's go on in our Romans 8 text to see specifically one of the ways in which the Holy Spirit helps us today. Again, beginning beginning at verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts, that's God, God the Father, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, that's us, in accordance with God's will. It's an interesting concept, really. One of our incredible resources of faith is described here as the work of the Holy Spirit of God praying for us. We usually think in terms of our praying to God. Here we learn that God, the Holy Spirit, actually prays for us. It's another way that we might be surprised by the Spirit. In our previous study of Romans 8, in our consideration of the hope that we have in the future resurrection and creation of the new heavens and the new earth, we saw in Romans 8.22 that the creation groans. The creation groans. That inanimate created world is impacted by the fall and the the created world groans in anticipation of a new day. And we saw in the next verse in Romans 8.23 that we who are Christ followers, we groan inwardly with our suffering in the present and with a longing for the future. We groan. Then comes the third mention of groaning in Romans 8. And this is not the groaning of the creation or the groaning of the people of God, but the groaning of the Holy Spirit. It's certainly a sympathetic groaning, God's Spirit joining our spirits in praying on our behalf, prayers of intercession for us. How good it is, how comforting it is to know that the Spirit intercedes for us with groans. That's just plain encouraging. Not only to know that the Spirit is praying for us, but that such prayers could be described as groans. It means that God knows us, and God feels what we feel. The Holy Spirit groans with us. John Stott, in his commentary on Romans, helps us to understand the nature of these Holy Spirit groanings as wordless or unspoken, but certainly not meaningless. I like what Charles Cranfield, the British commentator, writes about the Spirit's groanings. He writes, they are not spoken because they do not need to be, since God knows the Spirit's intention without its being expressed. What a wonderful encouragement that is to know that the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer is so sympathetic with us, so in tune with the Father, that those prayers offered by the Spirit are just what we need in just the moment that we need it. Recently, a student shared with me the importance of this passage of Scripture, these two verses. How knowing and experiencing the prayers of the Holy Spirit made all the difference in the world. The student who has given me permission to share this put it like this. I was depressed and didn't know how to pray. I had nothing. I knew that Romans 8 was an encouragement and I went there. 
my deep hurt was known and felt by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit didn't need my words. The Holy Spirit was filling in for me. And then with a turn of emphasis, the student went on to describe the tensions that came after a cross-cultural experience. I was overwhelmed with the needs of the world. I have been given everything. Why should I have so much? In the face of so much hardship in the world, how should I pray? How can I pray? What are the answers to these questions? The Holy Spirit knows, and he takes these things and brings them to God for me. The apostle says, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. How do you respond to your deepest personal and spiritual struggles? How do you handle the ethical and moral and political mess and the issues of our day? Things like abortion, child abuse, racism, genocide, sex trafficking, AIDS, poverty, and all the rest. Of course, there are issues to address. There are injustices to fight, and there are things to be done and that can be done and should be done. But at the end of the day, it is good to know that we have a helper, a counselor, a paraclete, one to lean on, one who is there to groan with us and to pray for us. He's there. He really is. Jill Briscoe wrote a book entitled The Deep Place. It's a book of conversations, personal conversations that Jill has had with God. And in this little book, Jill Briscoe talks about the deep place as the place where she goes in prayer to God, the place that she takes her greatest longings. And she sets up one of her conversations with God like this. The sun was shining, but it was a dark day. Have you ever had one of those? When there is darkness inside, it doesn't seem to matter how bright the sun shines in the sky. We had the world praying, or so it seemed. One of our children was in trouble, and so prayer was requested, and promises were made. We will pray, they said, and I knew they would and were. Yet nothing had changed. After a sleepless night and as soon as the sun rose, I went down to the side of the little fishing lake by our house in Wisconsin. And Jill says to God, there are lots of people praying. God responds, I hear them. Jill says, then, and she couldn't go on, God finished her sentence for her. Why haven't you seen any answers? Jill says, well, yes. Silence. I began to cry. Jill writes, sitting there in those early morning hours, I thought about our trouble. What did I believe? That God answered the prayers of his people? Yes, I believed that God indeed answered prayer. Then why had we seen no evidence of that fact? Reading my thoughts, God drew my attention to the beauty of the lake. It was like glass with myriad vapors and rainbow colors chasing across the surface. Isn't it funny how you can be looking at a beautiful thing and never see it because all you can see is your trouble? Unexpectedly, God spoke to Jill saying, Are there any fish in there? Jill answered, Of course. God said, How do you know? Jill said, Well, we've caught them with the grandkids, remember? He nodded. God said, do you believe that just below this glass-like surface where nothing moves, there is life and activity? Jill answered, yes. I looked at the smooth surface of our little lake and greatly wondered, what was he saying to me? Suddenly, one of his fish jumped, such a beautiful creature. And then words came clearly from God. Do you have to see a fish jump to believe that they are there, Jill? 
I knew at once where God was going with this. I thought about his question. He was asking me to trust him, to believe that he was indeed hearing all the prayers from around the world on our behalf. The surface of the situation appeared smooth and still, as far as I could see, just like the lake. But God was at work. Yes, he was, below the seemingly indifferent surface. And God said to Jill, as she records this conversation, God said to Jill, speak to me. It took a little while as I wrestled with my hurt at his seeming neglect of our urgent prayers, but I knew he wanted me to stay there until I could say what needed to be said and mean it. At last, I said as honestly as I was able, I will believe you have this thing in hand, Lord, despite all seeming evidence to the contrary. Yes, hear me, Lord, I will believe. And then peace came, and a smile worked its way across my heart, and that felt so good. How was it, I asked myself. I had not noticed how bright the warm sun was shining and the myriad of colors of the lake looked so beautiful. That's one of Jill Briscoe's conversations with God. Maybe you've had that kind of conversation. There are stretches of time when the struggles of life seem insurmountable and dark. But God is there to provide for us, to encourage us, to sustain us in sometimes surprising ways. Let's close in prayer and let's stand together as we pray. Lord God, you are our hope. You are our helper. Help us to believe. Help us to hear. Help us to speak. Help us to keep silent. Help us to pray. Help us to hope. If necessary, if need be, help us to be surprised by the Spirit. And we pray our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. You're watching WETN, a service of Wheaton College. For information on our programs, call 630-752-5061 or email wetn at wheaton.edu. A video program guide is available at wetn.org.